Hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this evening and thanks to everyone joining us online as well. My name is Daniel Lovalli Costal. I'm an architect, I'm a lecturer here at the Bartlett and also a PhD candidate in architectural design. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the Square Urbanism lecture, which will be given tonight by Martha Summers, an architect and artist working with themes of queer domesticity, self-fashioning and butch identity. But before we do that, um, Ben Kamkin is going to introduce the lecture series. Hi, uh, good evening everyone. So my name is Ben and I'm a Vice Dean for Public and City Engagement in the Bartlett. Um, and I'm a member of Be Queer, which is our LGBTQ plus network. And this series, Queering Urbanism, is a kind of legacy of us meeting just before the pandemic and deciding across our faculty that we wanted to have a staff student network which would do social events, but also think together academically using uh, queer studies and trans studies in relation to our discipline, um, and uh, then became a lecture series during the pandemic um, and has continued ever since. So um, it's something that I collaborated on uh, with Daniel tonight, but also with colleagues Jordana Romaglio, who's Associate Professor in the Development Planning Unit, and Lo Marshall, who's Senior Research Fellow in Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in our faculty, and Say Mali, who's a PhD student who's currently completing work on queer activism in London. So uh, past events from this programme are all uh, archived online, um, including the last one, which was really excellent, which was thinking about the climate crisis using queer thinking um, uh, by Vanessa Castamboroto. Um, and uh, yeah, Vanessa is professor in Sheffield and you can find her lecture on our archive. Um, and we've really always been committed to this being a public series, having it online as well as in person where we can. Um, and it being a free of charge uh, uh, series as well. So the intention behind the series is really to draw connections between queer studies and trans studies and urban studies and urban practices primarily, um, and tonight architecture as well. Um, and our aim is to provide a sustained space for discussion of those topics that brings forward speakers and evidence from a variety of different contexts. And we're interested in exploring how theoretical and methodological invention from queer and trans studies, but also from queer activism and trans activism, inform or could inform urban studies, urbanism and the built environment disciplines. So there's a long history, I'm sure many of you know, of work on the geographies of sexuality and gender going right back to the 1960s. But today, especially mediated by technology, there's a resurgence of interest in queer space and place and a globalized queer activism, um, which we have, uh, would consider as well. So even while sexual and gender diversity, of course, need to be understood in relation to specific contexts, um, we think that we can have a meaningful discussion across those contexts as well. Um, and in fact, one of the sort of primary lines of debate at the moment is around the decolonization of queer studies and queer uh, activism. And this is, of course, um, uh, right that that debate is happening. So we very much want to address these complexities and I'm really thrilled that we're able to uh, welcome Martha tonight and learn from Martha's work, um, particularly because of their role in uh, being involved in the design of the LGBTQ Centre in London, which I think if we think about architecture in relation to these themes, the typology of the LGBT Centre as an international typology is really, really interesting as a way into our series. Um, so I'm going to now hand back over to Daniel, who's going to explain the format. Thank you. Um, so a couple of bits of a uh, housekeeping for tonight. For everyone in the room, um, there's a emergency exit at the back, also here at the front, and we have toilets on this floor on the corridor that way to your right hand side. And then for both the people in the room and the people online, we're recording this event. So at the end, when we open for the Q&A, if you do not wish your question recorded, please let us know so we can keep that bit out. And the format for tonight, uh, 
this is having an event. We have um, people joining us online and some of us in the room here in London. Martha will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then that will be followed up by a Q&A discussion with both the cohort here in the room and online. And so to introduce uh, our speaker more formally, Martha Summers is an architect and artist living and working in London. The practice explores themes of queer domesticity, self-fashioning and butch identity. She has designed a number of community and art spaces for the LGBTQ plus and feminist communities of London, working with London LGBTQ plus community center, Bishopsgate Institute, the Feminist Library, Camp Trans and Trans Pratt, to name just a few. The sculptural work includes med meditative, mended works alongside dyke camp original pieces that are at once playful and meaningful. Martha has shown work at a number of London galleries and has a forthcoming solo show at Round 46 at Aarhus in Denmark. She has previously worked in practice for AOC architecture and has and the mirroring in Basel, Switzerland, and is a 2023 RIBA Russian Star Awards winner. winner. And we're really delighted delighted to warmly welcome you to UCL and the Bartlett. I think a lot of us are particularly happy that in a series that has seen um, people looking at querying urbanism from so many disciplines that we're also having a designer uh, joining us tonight. So please uh, join me welcoming Martha. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. It's always the most thrilling moment of any lecture presentation, uh, the hybrid negotiations. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Daniel, for the lovely introduction and uh, Ben for talking about uh, what this lecture series is all about. Um, yeah, it's always uh, super exciting and validating to get to talk about this work um, at many different architecture schools. Um, I think in particular because when I was an architecture student, um, I certainly wasn't doing work like this and I certainly wasn't hearing about work like this. So it really feels like in like 10, 15 years, like the conversation has really shifted. So it always feels such a privilege to be able to come and talk about my work uh, in places like this. So uh, Daniel's kind of already introduced me. Um, it's a little bit of a summary of what I do. Um, it's very much, I guess, at this point, I'm at a bit of a turning point in my own practice. Um, I All of the projects I'm going to be talking about today, I completed whilst having a day job and kind of traditional practice, which I very recently have left. So I'm shifting into kind of like a more full-time multidisciplinary studio. Um, so the way that I talk about my work and the work that I've done is, is uh, maybe a little out of sync these days. Um, so let me just move this. Uh, yeah, this is a little summary, I guess, I've tried to put together uh, as, as I've been kind of moving through my practice and it's kind of come about through like one project leading to another. And recently I've been trying to reflect a little bit on exactly what I'm trying to do and like what the methodologies are. So I've been thinking about it as uh, working within a set of current conditions things that I'm working against, things that I'm in resistance of, and also thinking about going beyond our current conditions. So what that boils down to for me is thinking about mending often and how we can take a reparative approach, think about what's disposable and, and what we tend to deem disposable in society, thinking about who actually builds the projects that I work on. Um, in terms of against, it's a really for me about disruption and trying to disrupt the status quo, the architectural profession, what's thought of as kind of um, normative domesticity and, and kind of uh, normative architectural taste. Um, and then finally, I guess I've been thinking a lot recently about this idea of world building. 
um, which partly is about the way that you're practicing and trying to kind of uh, center joy and humor and be unapologetic. But I guess it also links back to this idea of trying to create more radical construction sites, trying to work in ways that are the ways in which we would like to be working in a sort of uh, uh, liberatory context. So the way I like to kind of talk a little bit about this idea of um, a lens or disruption, I guess, is that for me, architecture is a form of self-expression, whether architects like it or not. Um, you know, design cannot escape the conditions from which it emerges. So a lot of architects like to think of their work um, that might look a little bit like this, this group of many, many visuals, visually similar images I got from Google, um, as kind of neutral or apolitical or uh, just kind of, I, I guess, an answer to a question that's completely objective. But of course, this is a lens. This is the lens of typically of a kind of straight, white, cisgender man um, designing. Uh, and it's just the dominant kind of hegemonic lens that we see within design. So when I'm working, I'm trying to be kind of cognizant of my own lens, like the privileges within that, but also the ways in which um, I can bring out um, different aspects of my own identity, how those are going to come out inevitably, and also the way that the work uh, emerges from the people that I'm in community with. So this is a little summary of the projects I'm going to touch on today. Um, there's a few artistic projects in there. It's mostly kind of architectural projects. So I kind of got started doing this type of work uh, in 2016. I finished uh, my postgrad diploma at London Met and I was feeling quite disillusioned and quite angry about a lot of different things. And very optimistically, as a sort of 25 year old, decided that in my spare time, I was gonna try and start a feminist design collective, which was incredibly ambitious. And it was very difficult to like make that work. <laughs> but what it did evolve into was a kind of collective project, um, helping the feminist library um, move uh, from the space in Waterloo where they'd been for 30 years to their new space in Peckham. Now, this was a super drawn out project. It was like four years. Um, it took a very long time for them to find a space. They found a space and that fell through. But the big thing for me with this project was they had this existing space in Waterloo that had all these years of kind of um, richness embedded into its fabric. And the question is of kind of when you're starting out a new community space afresh, like how do you bring some of that richness with you? How do you create an environment where that kind of culture can be cultivated? Um, you know, how do you kind of not just leave all of this behind? So eventually uh, a space was found in Peckham, an old school hall. It was significantly smaller than the old library. Um, and what we did as a kind of collective, it was sort of Kaivis, the collective I set up, a few other people, like there was a fun coalition of different kind of um, groups and individuals. What we ended up doing was taking a bunch of recycled shelving. So it was all the shelving from the old library, some donated shelving, and we taped out the space, uh, like the, the outline of the new space in this barn and spent a weekend sourcing through all the shelving and kind of physically building what the new space would look like. So it was a very different way of working to what might be used to in traditional practice where you really kind of sit down and you decide what it's going to look like you send it off to someone to build it this was working backwards from what we had so we sorted through all that shelving and kind of inventoried where it was going to go we were kind of drawing a plan from the kind of one-to-one -one model model we were building in this space and the idea that we kind of developed with that shelving was relatively straightforward um, to take this space and line it in the collection. So you leave the center of the space as free as possible for events and film screening talks, whatever it may be. Um, the, the shelves in the center are kind of rolling stacks. Um, and then what that means is that the events that are taking place, they're taking place surrounded by the collection. In the old library, it was kind of a little rat's nest of different rooms. This really meant that Whenever something's taking place, you know, if there's a break or 
a moment of pause. People wander off, they start picking things off the shelves, they start looking at the archives. It really activates uh, the whole space. So uh, we send those shelves off to be powder coated. It was kind of like this one gesture, um, obviously a project with basically no budget. Um, we sent the shelves off to be powder coated to kind of unify them a little bit and kind of give things like a loving sort of like fresh coat of paint. And yeah, it was all assembled uh, by women. So it was designed entirely by women or people that were identifying as women at the time. Um, and uh, uh, yes, built entirely by women. And this is a picture of it in 2023. So it's really kind of bedded in at this point. It's basically the library reopened about a week before the pandemic began. So I don't really have any pictures of it from its kind of uh, <laughs> freshly open phase. And it wasn't really open to the public for a couple of years, obviously. Um, but what's really nice coming back to it um, a few years later uh, is to see that it has kind of um, bedded in and that setting up this kind of apparatus of the shelves, these like green shelves, created like a, a strong, sturdy backdrop for, you know, the volunteers, the people that run the library to start kind of nesting things into. And, you know, a lot of the, the things that we kind of planned for this design that then it was very difficult to kind of properly communicate given the kind of damp ending of like the pandemic beginning have happened anyway like leaving this space at the top of the space for artworks to be displayed there's certain places where we left out shelves so they could be kind of almost become kind of reading nooks and all of those things have just sort of happened naturally so yeah, so that was the feminist library. That was kind of how I got going with these kind of community projects. Um, so that finished in 2020. And then in 2021, uh, a friend of mine got in touch with me about the London LGBTQ plus community center. Now, this is a project I got involved with in like a way that I think really illustrates how I like to try and work on these projects, which is that uh, my, ex-girlfriend used to be involved in fundraising for the community center and I reached out to them a few years back saying I'm working on the feminist library if you need a hand with anything let me know then I get an email like years later saying we've got a space we're opening in five weeks um like you have to do it there's no one else um so obviously a great thing to be involved with but it really was a project where it was like I, I sat down after the first meeting I had with um, Sarah, one of the trustees, just to make like a program. And I was like, nothing is going to dictate what we do here more than the fact that we don't have any time. Um, so this was the space. It was, a, was an old kind of tourist shop in South Bank. This was what it looked like. When we got the keys. Um, so when there's that little time, you kind of have to immediately start thinking about things in quite creative, agile ways. So it was sort of almost making a shopping list of what we needed to do here, which was sort out that massive stain on the floor, um, think about how we're gonna arrange the space. And then primarily there was a, a function that this kind of shell of the space wasn't providing, which was a quiet space, a quiet room, which was needed for things like HIV testing, counseling sessions, kind of like a sensory space. Like basically a room needed to be created um, because that this was just one giant space so uh the number of positions were considered ultimately kind of got tucked into this corner as that was the best compromise in terms of it being like a fully accessible kind of therapy space um and kind of not massively compromising uh the rest of the space in terms of how many people you could fill uh, for an event uh, and also just thinking about like the cleanest construction process with so little time. Um, and also, you know, I was really determined to assemble, uh, <laughs> assemble an entirely LGBTQ plus team of people to build it. That kind of limits a little bit the skills you have available. Um, but it also, you know, thinking back to trying to find people to build it, uh, and no one would have been able to turn it around that quickly anyway. Um, so yeah, laying out the space, we've got all this donated furniture, which was really nice. It was kind of this, a bit of like a jumble of different stuff, which which really made it feel a little bit like a big house where kind of everyone's bought their own chair. So part of the work for me was just like curating that furniture, starting to like draw it all up, lay it all out, 
figuring out how we could use these nice things that we were being given. So this was the plan, how it ended up. Um, and yes, yeah, so this was me kind of taking that furniture and all the different rugs and stuff and plonking it in the space and trying to figure out. I think there was a couple of slides that there were mixed up. Yes, yeah, so this is the quiet room. Um, and so you can see there a picture in the top corner of two of the people that were part of the build team. So with this space, I guess, it was about kind of thinking about the skills of the people who were available to work on the build. So the person who was kind of free to build this room, it was about having a conversation with them and saying, what have you built before? Like, what skills do you have? Because I can just sit down and sort of design some kind of met set partitions with plasterboard and kind of just hand it over and be like, I'm just going to assume that you know how to do all of these different trades. And they didn't, like, they'd recently built a shed so instead I was like, okay, how can we build this in timber? Um, we used a kind of um, staggered stud wall with uh, acoustic roll uh, to do kind of like the acoustic isolation for the space. Um, and also like up in the soffit, there was just like this crazy tangle of services that would, never would have been time to sort out. Um, so decided to put a little uh, roof on it. So it basically was like a little shed which felt really nice. Like it felt like quite a sort of queer gesture to have a little kind of building inside a building. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was a very, um, you know, it wasn't, how do I put it? it? It was an incredibly fast paced project, like basically had to be designed in three weeks in order to get stuff together. And that was three weeks of like evenings and weekends. <laughs> so it was very challenging and it was kind of about like figuring things out a little bit on site. Um, and, you know, this project was a six month pilot and very quickly it got an extension for a five month lease. So now for me, I kind of look at this project as like a bit of a funny one to reflect on because it was designed and built very, very quickly with the idea that it was temporary. And now it's, you know, it's pretty much a permanent space. Um, so it's interesting to kind of watch how something that was essentially a pop up is kind of like bearing up to um, quite a speedy process. So the next project I was involved in was an exhibition at the Barbican in the Curve Gallery called Out and About, um, which was showing 40 moments from the Bishopscape Institute, which is uh, one of the largest archives of LGBTQ plus ephemera in the UK. Uh, if you've never been to the Bishopsgate Institute, it is amazing. I highly encourage you go there and have a talk from Seth and you will not regret it. Um, so this was a bit of a shift for me, like these other two community projects, you know, very DIY, a little bit chaotic, like there's really freeing things about working in that way, but there's also a lot of challenges, like you don't exactly have a budget. It's, it's like uh, funny territory. This is obviously, working with an institution, it's, it's a very different type of environment to be thinking about community in. So initially I was kind of looking at this like, well, the curve feels to me like this kind of white cube space. There's no windows, like it feels quite institutional. It feels quite kind of somber and serious. And then on the right, like here's a photograph from a Bishopsgate Institute open day, which is not your typical archive. Like they chuck things out on the table. It's very hands-on. Um, how do you kind of start to marry those two spaces? So when I started to look a bit more at the curve, I started to see the queerness in the space. So it's a bent space, you know, it feels linear at first glance, but it's actually, it's bending, it's constantly concealing and revealing. Um, it's very kind of tall chapel-like space. There's a lot of strange things happening acoustically. It's also a leftover space. It's kind of this unwanted, strange chunk of the Barbican um, that just is kind of left over from, from the plan. <clears throat> so it actually felt like it could be quite a fruitful space to work in. So I generated a plan that um, basically meant you couldn't take any one particular route through the exhibition. Like what we didn't want to do was tell a kind of story of queer history that said it started here, then this happened, then that happened, the end. Instead, you know, there was no kind of uh, linearity to like uh, the curation. There was no kind of A to B or movement through time. 
There was multiple groups through the show, and there was also a turning point at the kind of halfway point, so to speak. We had uh, this kind of salon hang of signs uh, from the Museum of Transology. And that kind of meant then you turn back on yourself and you maybe start to reflect a little bit differently about the things that you saw, take a slightly different route on your way back to the entrance. Um, the other thing uh, with this kind of delinearity was placing uh, the reading uh, area at the very center of the exhibition. Um, so the idea there was that rather than, I think, often you'll see with shows, the reading area kind of like right at the start, or right at the end, and it's kind of siloed off as a kind of separate activity. Here it was placed right at the very heart of the show, meaning that it kind of created this quite kind of um, messy and noisy space that kind of bled out into the rest of the space. Um, and that was kind of riffing off um, the Lesbian Her Story archives in New York, which is one of my favorite buildings, which is an archive in a house. So it feels really domestic and cozy and it feels like a really nice intimate kind of setting to be looking at our, what are often quite intimate stories. Um, so I wanted to capture a little bit of that uh, in this reading area. Now, the other question with this show, I guess, was how could we deal with archival materials in a way that reflects the slightly more kind of hands-on approach that the Bishopsgate have, which is a really great, uh, more kind of queer way, I guess it feels, of engaging with material that isn't so kind of um, separated out from kind of um, archivist and archive accessor. It's probably a more eloquent way of putting that. Um, so wherever possible, things were not behind glass. We kind of were just hanging things gently with bulldog clips on the wall. Um, where there were badges, I designed these kind of fabric-y display boards for them to kind of sit a little bit more in like what a kind of badges context should be. Um, we also had all of these club flyers to display. So the idea with that was um, creating a... Uh, table um, where they were all kind of um, scattered across it and then held in place with a piece of perspex and some bungee cord. Um, we also had a bunch of magazines that we wanted people to be able to click through and read, not just have them in a case open on one page. So did this kind of um, slightly uh, contemporary version of a kind of medieval chain library uh, where, let's move this up a little bit. Uh, yes, we had these like facsimile versions of the magazines with a little leather tab and these plastic chains kind of holding them against the wall. This is a detail of the, the flyer table that I mentioned. Um, really tried to kind of squeeze in as many little details as possible that felt like they were referencing um, materials that felt kind of, well, bungee cord certainly feels like a lesbian material to me. <laughs> um, I mean, here you can see like the flannel curtains. Um, so then where there were cases, because there were things that had to go in cases. But the cases, you know, this wasn't a huge budget show. It was kind of the Barbican testing out this new uh, approach to using the curve. Like, it was kind of a bit of an experiment. Um, so there wasn't a massive budget. There weren't going to be any new cases. So for the cases, we basically went searching through the storerooms of the Barbican, found old cases from other exhibitions, a whole, like, mishmash of different cases of shapes, sizes, heights, um, made new bases for them to bring them all up to the same height and repainted them. Um, what that meant is, as opposed to kind of when you're doing a big budget exhibition where you curate a laser everything out very carefully and says, this is having a conversation with this and these two things have to go together and you sent that case off to get made. This is more like packing suitcases. It was kind of what will fit in the cases that we've got. And that actually led to this really nice opportunity for like unexpected juxtapositions to occur between different things. Things were sitting next to each other that you probably wouldn't have expected and it, it created some kind of interesting conversations. There's a few other kind of domestic moments, um, a lot of kind of curtains and fabrics were used. Um, all of the furniture for the reading room was second hand. I kind of went and dug out from an antique shop and then got sent to the Barbican on a cargo bike, which was quite a funny day. Um, 
And also thinking about domesticity formally, like use three different types of table leg, a kind of wheeled IKEA table leg, a traditional farmhouse leg, and a 2D abstraction of that. I started to kind of play around with that and distort it. And other bits of the furniture in the show, just trying to kind of play around with the slightly like distorted forms of domesticity. And then finally on this project, um, it felt like a really fun opportunity to think about materiality. So um, the terms here on the right are things I feel like I've heard, maybe people here have heard often, if you take them without the prefix, used often in architectural practice in a way that is positing these things as kind of objectively good. That when something is ordered, when something is rational, when you're using restraint, when things are really precise and consistent, that that is objectively good architecture, good taste, that's how everything should be. Um, particularly this idea of honesty, the material honesty has always really troubled me because it seems to be used kind of um, extremely inconsistently um, in a way that it's, it's kind of just like serving the narrative of whoever's using it. So I kind of wanted to challenge these terms that I felt so I'm kind of frustrated and sick of um, because obviously as a queer person and as a trans person, you know, a lot of those things I am not vibing with in my life. <laughs> So in this material palette, I kind of was like, let's try and be as inconsistent as possible. Let's have lots of contradiction. Let's use things that feel like artifice and let's be playful and uh, let's not be particularly restrained. Like I'm probably gonna do too much. There's gonna be things that aren't gonna work. There's gonna be, it's gonna be a bit of an experiment. Um, but it was a really nice opportunity to kind of start to play around with you know, within kind of limited means, um, how you could start to materially resist those ideas. So the final project, uh, architectural project I'm gonna talk about today is a project I did last year. And this was a project called Camp Trans. Uh, if you don't know Camp Trans, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It is um, a bunch of trans people going camping in the woods in the summertime, having a nice time together. Um, and it's basically, I think, a charity. Maybe it's a kick. But I know some of the people who kind of set it up. And they reached out to me last year uh, because um, we needed to raise some funds for low-income tickets to the camp. So the idea was to put on this exhibition show some work from people who were involved in the camp, who went to the camp in the first year, or just generally people who are community organizers. Um, and yeah, go from there. So the plan that you see here is kind of the only plan I really drew. So this is a plan of a gallery. It's Ugly Duck in Bermondsey. But I was reimagining it basically as a campground. So the idea was we're going to go camping in this gallery. And the idea was kind of coming from thinking about the similarities between camping and exhibition making where it's a lot of temporary structures um you're often conjuring up kind of a wider vision of domesticity from very limited means um there's a little bit of improvisation um and in particular I was thinking a lot about this idea of interdependence which was the theme of the show it was called interdependent on me baby and it was about trans inter interdependence and i was thinking a lot about camping structures and the way that they are kind of interdependent or at the very least like often with tents and canopies and things like that it's very thin uh kind of um fabric basically but it's held in tension in this way um, you know, with stakes driven into the ground or things wrapped around trees um, to create something often like quite incredible or, um, you know, a, what feels like a very strong, hard surface. So what we ended up doing for this show was uh, creating a bunch of structures that could be used for the exhibition, which for which the budget was £200 and we didn't go over it. So we created a bunch of structures that would be used for the exhibition 
and then could be packed down into a backpack and taken to camp and used again later that year. So it was really as thrifty as it gets. So um, we were making this kind of big sort of community tarp tent. It was like a big patchwork of some recycled tarpaulins and new bits. Um, there was also a canopy and some other bits and bobs, but this was kind of like the big tent that we made that went up in this kind of almost like community kind of barn raising <laughs> Um, at probably about 8 p.m. by the time we actually got it up. Um, but it was a really nice kind of collective effort to create this gigantic thing. Um, this was the little canopy stage that we made. And, you know, part of part of the way that the, we had the cost down was literally going to the woods and getting branches as our building material, um, like as you would if you were camping. You can see that on the right is... Can you just click the minimize? And oh, yeah. On the left. The top left. Top like the left. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um that just on the right there is an example of kind of on the day we just had a bunch of extra materials like branches and rope. And the idea was that the install of the exhibition was to some degree a camp making exercise. That there was a whole bunch of volunteers there. There wasn't really time to design everything. So people just kind of got stuck in and started picking up branches and string and kind of improvising certain elements of the exhibition on the day, like we were making camp together. So then here it is a couple of months later, you know, kind of put up in a very different way. Um, it's that exact same tent. Um, it was really nice kind of experience of, you know, uh, it was again, quite a collective effort to kind of get this gigantic thing up and, you know, before we were kind of stringing it up in this gallery space and now we're kind of tying a rope between some trees. Uh, and actually it ended up being like a very, very wet camp. So the massive tent was used for like loads and loads of workshops, which obviously it wasn't really nice to be damp, but it was really nice to see people kind of gathering under this shelter. Um, so I'll finally just touch a little bit on my artistic practice, um, which, overlaps increasingly, I guess, with the architectural one. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, the projects that I've shown, uh, the architectural projects that I've shown, there are kind of themes and thinking often around kind of reparative methods or mending in particular. So with the community centre, we had all that kind of aluminium slat wall that came with the shop that a lot of people would have liked to have kind of ripped out and said, you know, this isn't kind of on trend anymore. But I really encouraged us to try and take what I would have was referring to at the time, I guess I would still call like a gender non-conforming lens on beauty to try and look at it again and say, like, do we absolutely have to get rid of this? Like, could it be useful to us? Like, you know, actually slat wall is like quite a versatile like wall surface. Like, why don't we try and live with this and like see if we absolutely have to tear something out just because we think it's ugly? Um, so this is a few examples of smaller scale kind of mending projects. Uh, a chair um, mended with leather straps and no, no glue. Um, this pot in the middle is from like a series um, of kind of fragments um, found mud -locking. They're kind of like the things you find mud -locking that no one's interested in, just like a broken piece of glass. And then I kind of take those and like create a kind of hole for them. Um, this here actually is my dining table at home, which has legs from one of the out and about tables that were kind of ripped apart in the deinstall, which I then took home and kind of made this like marbled mend for. Um, and uh, I guess there's a few other kind of sculptural works where ideas about kind of um, construction and DIY, uh, and I guess almost like the culture of that and the culture of that within kind of uh, butch lesbian identity start to kind of come into play. So this is a warning tape that I made. It's diagonally knitted, so it's more like a scarf. Um, these are two pieces um, which are talking about, uh, I guess, kind of gender identity and uh, kind of mending within the body um, and also thinking uh, about, uh, I guess, the idea of 
things that some might refer to as sex toys as sex tools. Um, and yes, also there's like a kind of big theme in the sculptures I make of queer domesticity. These are kind of seasonal sculptures. Um, this is a, a recent one, an egg tray, um, which is playing on the form of the O-ring. And this is the thing that I'm currently working on at Central St. Martin's, plugging another university also here, um, and doing an installation there called Continuous Cruising, which is about uh, the disappearance of dyke spaces in particular in London, or less the disappearance and more the fact that they've become kind of untethered and unmoored, and that generally what we see in our spaces is that there are events that are kind of popping up around the city, but we kind of lack permanent spaces. So to take over that it's being installed on Friday, kind of turning this very thin window gallery into a narrow boat, um, kind of imagined narrow boat kind of dike bar. That is the end. So much, Martin. Um, Shall I come over there? Yes, I'm thinking that maybe we'll pull the table away and we'll come bring the chairs. Great. Um, Yeah. Well, I think if you were to, to oh, right. we need to come over this side. So I will actually the screen. Yeah. Oh okay. You're keeping on the yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Um I I really enjoyed the the presentation and um, have the privilege tonight as well to ask the first question or first couple of questions and then we'll open to um, all of you folks in the room but also online. Um, the first one, which is a question that we that we tend to ask uh, everyone who comes as part of the of the series, but I'm sort of um, um, uh, rephrasing a little bit is. For you, what does it mean to queer urbanism or urban practices? I'm asking about practices because your work is very much hands-on. Um, I think it's something that I'm I'm starting to kind of like shift what I, my answer to that would be. But probably what I've said for the last four years <laughs> is, um, I think it, it's for me often been about what I'm in resistance to. I think working in traditional practice, and this is why right now feels like a turning point for me, is because I've always wondered what would my practice look like if it wasn't always feeling like it was completely in relation to what I'm doing day to day. Like, so I generally have seen kind of like queering space as taking the opportunity to, I guess, I guess change the way you're orientated or uh I mean it's multifaceted I think it's partially about like how you're thinking about the space like trying to kind of think about it in a in a in a bent way in a non-linear way those kind of factors but I think often for me it feels like quite a material concern and it's about like how you can be playful and camp with materials and, and those types of things. But I have to say like, that is a question I always find so hard to answer. <laughs> um, and I have another one of my own, which is, um, is more related to the fact that throughout all of these projects, you're working practically with zero budget or close to zero budget. Even your project at the Barbican, which is probably like you would imagine of the Barbican, a, was, a lavish it was okay in the institution. End. And yet when it ha when it's about a queer event, it's like, oh, you can have mm. uh, this much. But yet you always seem to be able to find a, uh, a moment, a corner, a detail of um, joy, if not luxury. And 
And when we see so much architecture and, um, and, and, and urban design that is so driven by austerity, how, how do you manage to include those moments of joy and luxury, even in projects that have like not near zero budget? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think it, it, I think it's partially because it always feels very important to me. Like with these community spaces, I guess the approach that I take is like, I want to set up a, like an apparatus basically mm -hmm. that other people can come in and make their own. And that isn't about like doing absolutely nothing, you know, like you, you have some skills that you can help out with. So you're there for a reason, but it's about doing just enough that, um, there's like a baseline level of quality that people still feel they can come and like put a poster on the wall, they can repaint this, they can do that, but it doesn't feel like everything's like falling apart at the seams um, and there's no care taken. So I think it's partly about like prioritizing, um, I guess the care I feel like my community deserves. And I think it also is, I think it's probably ultimately about like, love like I think that these projects you know because I've been working on them you know in my free time <laughs> no one does that for no reason you know it, it it comes from a place of kind of love and and the connections that come from these projects and and the new friendships that come from them and you get like a type of fulfillment from that that you you don't get in traditional practice at all so I think that like um I I just think I'm determined to you know if I have like the, the privilege of being able to be involved in projects like this and and like the responsibility of knowing that I'm kind of shaping the space a little bit like I'm determined then that there's like a standard <laughs> that that's met that it isn't just kind of someone coming around and kind of playing about with a project because they have the chance to you know does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I've got quite a few more, but I'd love to hear from either from online or from the room. Thanks. Uh, I mean, just a quick question, I guess. Uh, it's like, how do you think the nature of the institution or organization you are working with impacts your work? Like, I guess it's not the same working for a feminist group than working for the Barbican that is so institutionalized, yeah. right? So I was wondering how that influences the work. I think it massively influences it. I'm finding this at the moment doing this thing at CSM, which is like a group project for Queer History Month, where like a collective of people called Take Up Space and you know, I'm um, being reminded again that like there's a lot of bureaucracy in in institutions and you can't just be like we're doing an event. It's like you have to speak to like 20 people and like write a million health and safety reports and stuff. Um it's it swings and roundabouts, you know, because like these institutions like have the money and the resources, and it's just quite hard to get that stuff. And then it's also quite difficult to then use space or do something that maybe feels radical on some level. I think that Barbican exhibition felt like a bit of an exception. And I feel like I was quite blessed with it because ultimately like everyone in the team was like on the same page. Like Steph and the Bishopsgate Institute is really cool and like wanted to do basically exactly the same thing I wanted to do. And the people at the Barbican just kind of let us get on with it and just gave us the money for it, which was great. I don't think that happens that often. Um, when you're working with like community organizations, I mean, it really varies. I think it's, I think the tricky thing is, is sometimes when you aren't getting paid for something, it's very hard sometimes to make people understand how much time it design takes and how much work little changes can make. And it's very hard to kind of like do the negotiation of like, <laughs> You know, you're, 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 you know, you're doing it out of love and care, but also like you are also a person with like, you know, who has to look after their mental health and their like physical health and all the rest of it. And it can be quite tricky to get things over the line. Um, but 
I think the, the main difference I say is that basically like when things are a bit more DIY, there's so many more possibilities. And like you've got so much more free reign to like work in like new ways to like say like, yeah, everyone on this team. I mean, even with the Barbican, everyone who fabricated stuff for that was queer. Like it was still kind of possible, but not everyone who installed it, because it's like they just have their team. Um so yeah, I think there's there's a lot more flex flexibility in those more DIY environments, but they for sure come with a lot of challenges. And I think that like it would be so good to kind of generate almost like a toolkit for that type of work and and to be able to have better conversations with people who have never worked with an architect before, but not in a way that because but then also you're not really working in a way an architect traditionally works. So it's it's a funny one. <laughs> so we have sorry then. <laughs> There's a question online. Or... Yeah, there are a few questions online. So we can take your question then, then, and then a couple online. And so I wanted to ask about um, your work in like a more traditional practice and how that informed maybe your own practice afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I was quite through your presentation thinking of my own work in someone's practice uh, where you kind of look for your you produce work that needs approval mm -hmm. in a sense of the person who leads the practice and I think it is very could be very restrictive depending on what gender that person is and their perception of you know the the build environment and their role in it and so on yeah. and how that and I wanted to ask if you work yeah what was the gender <laughs> of the person you worked for and how that maybe make you question your approach when you started working in your own practice for yourself uh, and how to like, yeah, kind of work against whatever you disapproved in their approach. Yeah, yeah I think I've exclusively worked under like middle-class men. Um, so, you know, I'm sick of it. <laughs> um, it's, it's like, a, yeah, it's a very specific vibe and I think like I kind of long ago gave up trying to sort of change anything in the office like ultimately I feel I mean maybe I've just become extremely cynical and worn down but I feel like even with this stuff around like diversity and inclusion which like well-meaning practices will try and do these drives but what they never look at is like how they design what they think is good what they think good architecture looks like like they never look at like what ideas are allowed in this space architecturally. Like they're happy to kind of say like, we want more people like this, we want more people like that. Like we want to promote people like this, all of that. But it's still um, the ideas and the politics that are embedded within what they actually think design should look like is alienating to the people they're saying they want to try and get in. So I've sort of given up to some degree on the idea that like, because they're businesses, like they're profit-making businesses. So it's their name on the door, they're taking the risk. And, you know, it's up to them. Ultimately, they get to call the shots. And it's like, you can try and kind of agitate that. Um, but I think you have to be in like a really specific type of practice for there to be anything close to like a truly kind of like collaborative atmosphere. Um, and I mean, that's the thing that I try to be cognizant of in my own work and I'm really reflecting on a lot at the moment, which I think almost made me feel like I presented my work worse than I usually do today, um, is this idea of like ego within architecture and the fact that like it's always there and, and taste in particular. Like I think I've spent quite a while really banging this drum of like, I love bad taste, ugly stuff is amazing. And starting to actually go, well, what's considered ugly, what's considered bad taste, that like shifts all the time. So actually it's less about saying that there's just this opposite end of the spectrum that we should be obsessed with. And instead saying there's just this huge multiplicity of modes of working, aesthetics, all these different things that should just be coexisting. So sounds yeah. <laughs> very impassioned. <laughs> 
Thank you. Shall we hear some of the questions online? I don't know if the people online want to say them aloud, or if not, um, yeah, Omar can read them. We can do that. Um, so yeah, we do want to um, see it online. So let, let me start with the first question. It was written. Um, um, so how would you define the language of queer architecture? Um, or is it counterintuitive, um, heteronormative to try to define it? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, it probably is <laughs> counterintuitive to try and define it. I think that's why, like the first question you asked, and I've been asked that sort of question before, and it always feels like very slippery. And I think it's partly because like for me, I like when I was an architecture student, I wasn't out yet. So whilst I can look back at the work and be like, that had some kind of like gay vibes going on. Uh, you know, I I guess I didn't sort of graduate and go, right, I'm gonna start like a queer practice. I'm gonna do like queer projects and like, and it's informed by like heaps and heaps of reading that I've done. It would more sort of like emerge from being in community with other people and kind of saying like, I have a certain set of skills and I can help with this, I can help with that and one project leading to another. And then at some point having a momentum that made me kind of say like, oh, I'm sort of, sort of have a practice here, um, which I guess is why it feels, yeah, it feels like a very difficult thing to define because I think also queerness itself is so, uh, expansive and it always like defies language like we always like, end up tied in these like linguistic sort of unhelpful knots so I think that yeah we're gonna do the easy answer and say can't be defined <laughs> and if you want to ask your question then we can take another one for online um so we do have um uh, a couple more um do you have a vision for how we can restore the number of queer spaces in our cities, given that we've lost so many in the past decade? Mm. There's someone else in this room who can answer that question, question better than me. Um, well, I mean, we've been talking about this uh, in this project at CSM, this take up space thing we're doing. Um, that's kind of what it's all about, but it's focused less, it's focused more specifically on I'm gonna say dyke asterisk spaces, like dyke and everything adjacent to that. Um, because I guess it feels like uh, there's a kind of gaping hole in terms of permanent spaces for us. Um, it's a very tricky one because like, I mean, it's, it's ultimately like gentrification and just like the cost of doing anything. And, you know, obviously there's recently been this like really incredible moment um, where a new uh, lesbian bar was opening on Broadway Market and so many people turned up, like Broadway Market was like filled with lesbians. It was like called Winter Pride. Um, and off the back of that, the people who ran that are now setting up an actual permanent above ground space. Um, but you know, how like financially viable would that be? Like they've already had to like, fundraise for it like it's really challenging um and I I don't know what the answer is because the answer that we have right now is I guess the thing that I'm trying to talk about at this event that I'm setting up which is that like we are kind of like unmoored like we're we're cruising around the city going from place to place wherever we'll kind of host us um and there are strengths to that like I do with this event I'm almost asking the question of like are there strengths to that that we're forgetting about that like it's slightly less surveilled like you know kind of the only one I've got but <laughs> um I guess it's yeah it's it's questioning about like can we be doing more with like with what we do have um and then I mean Christ knows like what how how else we get like more permanent spaces I guess that's it's something I haven't thought lots about, but I'm very keen to kind of be a part of the conversation we're having about it at CSM. Thanks very much for the talk. It was great. Um, I guess the point is that nothing's really permanent anyway. But, yes. um, oh, yeah. but yeah, I think um, I, I was really, uh, I loved the way that you talked about resistance and you used that 
in relation to politics, institutions, but also materials. Um, and yeah, I, I got a lot out of you talking through your projects. And I, I was interested that you started off by saying, you know, you wish there'd been something like this in architecture school, and that all of your projects are about kind of community building around knowledge, so archives or resources. Um, and I was wondering, like, in terms of the work that you do, if you could say something about how you kind of think, how you do research or how you bring forward precedence <laughs> or whether that's even important because you're rather working through the materials as a kind of archive. Um, and if you were, you know, in, in architecture school now, what would be useful in terms of learning about kind of queer design? Because I think what is inspiring about your work is that I don't think we really have had a very strong queer design queer inclusive design kind of movement in this country compared to, for example, the US. So I think it's I'm capturing something that's really, you know, comes up in Daniel's work as well. And it's really like um, an interesting time. So if you were to go back to architecture school, what would be useful to learn about? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I think because if someone is like, let's sit down and like look at some queer architects, they're usually like extremely wealthy gay men, white gay men, you know, from across like the sort of 500 year period or whatever. And there are some interesting things in that, you know, I'm a big fan of Strawberry Hill House, but like, um, you know, there's certainly like, I mean, you see um, people kind of digging around to try and find like, like lesbian architects in history and even then it will sort of be like two extremely like wealthy women like you know it's a very limited history in that sense and I think for me also I mean I found from like the bits of teaching that I've done it's a bit tricky to kind of come into a space even though when you're a queer architecture student you're just sort of being given like sort of heteronormative options all the time but when you come into an architecture school and you're trying to sort of like talk about queerness to a lot of people who like aren't queer I think ultimately it's just about like a far more like disruptive and like non-normative uh like discourse just existing like that if there could be more of like a looseness and and in particular I think if architecture schools could be more of a landscape of kind of like self-reflection and self-discovery particularly in undergrad I think like you know that's primarily people that are like 18 19 21 and I think if you go to art school that's often like this incredible place where people can like really like think about themselves like find out about things about themselves like make community and 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 do like quite a lot of different stuff I think for me architecture school felt like a closet and it felt a lot like a sort of like preparing you to have a job and go off and like that you're sort of like on a particular track that feels heteronormative because it's incredibly kind of like you know it's you're doing what sort of capitalism wants you to do um and that's because architecture is like such an incredibly like capitalist profession for the most part i guess but so the very, very rambly answers that I'm giving today. I guess the point I'm making is um, I would love architecture schools to feel far more kind of like they are questioning whatever the current status quo is. And I think there's more and more of that, but particularly my diploma just felt like it was sort of like a factory for going into the workplace. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a way that wasn't even like accidental, you know, sort of like proudly a factory of like, you're going to be able to really churn out a housing development. <laughs> it's just like, what is that? You know, why are we at university? You're going to do that in practice. Thank you. Is that? <laughs> um, do we have another one online? We and then we do have to online. Okay. Um... We can do one online, one in the room, and then, and then the, last, the last one online, yeah. Um, so the concept of unnatural mm -hmm. um, has been used against us um, yeah. for a long time, but recently there's been a reclaiming of nature as inherently queer. So do you see any collaboration possible between queer design and uh, biophilic design? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the natural one is actually a really interesting one, which I almost sometimes don't want to put on that list because I think it's more questioning, like, um, there's a specific definition of, like, natural amongst architects generally, and then that specific definition is kind of, like, put on a pedestal, um, you know, just, like, the idea of sort of, like, bare timber being kind of special and good and that if you painted it suddenly it would be like terrible and and kind of um perverted um but yeah definitely actually there's a really interesting um installation right now sorry to keep plugging it at csm in the left of your window gallery um someone in the group um does a lot of stuff with mycelium and they've kind of taken things from the responses that people have given about queer space and then they've grown mycelium like over like like barbie dolls and various things that kind of represent stuff that's been mentioned in the responses so i think yeah like um yeah i don't uh mention nature in a way that is completely unthinking but i don't know much about biophilic designers so i can't give an incredible answer to that to be honest <laughs> thank you hello oh, spell out <laughs> um uh, my question is um I'm a garden designer, and in garden design, we're taught about unity of detail, unity of hard landscape, and unity in planting, um, and that disunity is a really bad thing and should be kind of avoided at all costs. And we're only kind of seeing that now in the more naturalistic planting that's coming out of, you know, Chelsea, part of the rewilding movement. Um, and I loved your slide of um, collectively sourced and kind of foraged materials. And um, I think I have ideas of my own answer to this question, but I would love to know for you what um, in that kind of jumbled materiality feels so intrinsically queer. Mm. And when you're working with that kind of eclectic palette of materials, when you're doing exhibitions or um, interior architecture inside buildings, what the advantages and disadvantages are of working in that way? Um, well, I guess I think about like, this idea of queer self-fashioning. And I've tried to like interpolate that into an idea of queer space fashioning, which is almost like how I think about my practice, that queer self-fashioning is this like <clears throat> incredibly DIY thing. Like for me, it's DIY in like two senses. One, like I'm a butch dyke, I like DIY. I can, I can sort of put an, out, an outfit together from being you. But like, it's also DIY in the sense that like when you're a queer person, you know, your identity is not like served to you on a plate. You don't just like turn the TV on and go, oh my God, I relate to this. I'm reading this book that I picked off a shelf. Like, this is me. You know, you have to DIY your kind of personhood. You have to go out into the world and 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 and, and find the resources, find these kind of like needles in the haystacks that like speak to you and help you like understand yourself and help, help you kind of craft yourself. Um, and I think that like, when it comes to thinking about materiality, I think about like, I guess um, there's like an idea about like uh, tailoring as well with DIY, like how I'm often tailoring and mending things that kind of weren't made for me. Um, and I try to kind of reflect that in the architectural practice. Um, with the materials, um, I guess there's just this feeling with queerness of like, it ultimately, like, I spent a very long time in the closet. Like, I was kind of, like, a straight woman until I was 25. And that was, like, 10 years of being, like, an adult straight woman. And, like, that was all about, like, trying to, like, you know, conform to, like, a very rigid set of standards so that I would be legible as the thing that I was trying to be legible as. Mm -hmm. And, like, I think what I've found with queerness is, like, there's this incredible strength in illegibility and like you know um in so many different senses like the the thing that you're kind of putting together visually is maybe illegible and having like a gender that's often illegible or misinterpreted or only inter interpretable to some people so I guess it's like gay eclecticism but it's <laughs> something else um and then your follow-up was like something about the challenges of that. Yeah, and like what's positive about it as well in working in that way. And it's just very freeing, you know. I think that like 
part of the reason maybe I'm like struggling to talk about it today compared to normal is because I feel like I'm at a, like a real point in my practice where it's like I've been doing things a certain way and I'm starting to like have a critical lens on like everything I've done so I don't feel like I can talk about it with the same conviction but um it's very freeing to kind of go oh let's just do whatever like we'll have like clunky details and this can be chunky and like what's wrong with that looking like a bit odd and weird and like almost just like opening up the possibilities of like let's say everything I was taught was actually wrong and we'll just do the opposite as yeah. much as possible and then starting to like dial back from there <laughs> and see what actually is helpful um yeah I don't know if that answered you do we have more questions online? I have one short question online. So, um, how have the needs of the LGBTQ plus center changed from the original London Gay and Lesbian Center in the 1980s? Well, to be honest, you'd have to ask the people running it. Um, I think, um, yeah, that's that's a question for Lip, who runs the center, to be honest. <laughs> but I think it's. Um, it's an interesting space because there are other spaces in London, like there's the Outside Project and, um, you know, I guess the Feminist Library in a way is, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty dikey there. So it's kind of like a bit of a queer community centre. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I honestly would probably find it hard to answer that question. I feel like I'm, you know, it's actually, um, you mentioned this earlier, Ben, about like references and stuff like that. And I think, the thing that I like regret the most with a lot of these projects is like they're incredibly fast paced and I like to research <laughs> and it's incredibly hard to like actually find the time to sit down and take a really exciting and like vital brief like some of these projects and place it correctly like in the context that it should be placed in and trace like a lineage of the other spaces, the spaces that it's, you know, in a network with like the real kind of like rigor that you can apply to a project of such school. That then in the real world where the program is super tight, there's no budget and it's kind of like, it's it's the one thing that really actually does frustrate me about this way of working, I think. Um, so yeah, I can't answer that question because I'm bad. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the room? So yeah, so I really like the work you showed and it was very community based, but I was just thinking like a lot of the queer work I've seen has a very often to do with nightlife and more of the festival celebration side. And whereas you seem to focus on the coziness, domesticity more, is this your choice? Would you want to be more open to the nice life urban side of queer urbanism or do you prefer to say, stay on the domestic side? Uh, I think it's like a bit of both. Like I think, um, I think I, over time, like the architectural projects and my artistic projects, a, a, year, a year ago, I was invited to speak at the Museum of the Home about queer domesticity. And I had like this moment where I was like, oh, well, actually, I don't know that much about queer domesticity. And, you know, I uh, like haven't really like massively studied it and like read all the stuff. And the guy that was inviting me was like, but that's what your work is about. And I was like, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I hadn't made the connection before. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, I've always been very interested in like ideas of the home. And I think that like, for me, like without getting too personal, like I don't really have a family home. Uh, I have, you know, I think for me, these projects often like are my home and like my community is my home. And I think that that's why I'm so drawn to thinking about the domestic, um, which is the site of so much kind of like often trauma and bad feeling for queer people, but also ultimately is kind of what you're often looking for is like home and feeling of home and feeling of safety so I think it I think it really speaks to me um I think I probably think of like nightlife and clubs more as like escape and like a place to kind of completely like let go and like be like sexy and visible 
um and like these spaces more as like probably slightly more like introverted maybe um but equally like this this thing the the thing i'm doing at csm um you know that has made me start thinking about a different type of space but then again i'm doing something that's basically a narrow boat which is a house so i can't help myself <laughs> On the narrow boat. No, but I want to. <laughs> um, if there are no immediate question from the floor, I do have a couple, a couple more, but also don't want to uh, monopolize the mic. Um, I think the first one is about drawings and process and design tools. Um, but I was really very early on in the presentation. I was really fascinated by that sort of like folded out drawing of the plan with the four elevations because mm. I, really, I really like the way it flattens that sort of hierarchy of how we represent architecture mm. but also how we use drawings to design and what we prioritize in certain drawings yeah. it's all about the plan in certain projects all about the this and that and that sort of like way of working flattens it out can, can you elaborate like how I'm actually interested from from looking at that drawing interested in your process yeah. a bit more understanding that also like it tends to be very fast paced well on the majority of these including the bulk of one actually I try to work on the computer as little as possible in my own practice <laughs> um because I just don't find it fun to sit and draw in CAD and I think that if you work in a way that you enjoy the joy comes through in the projects. And I think it retains a certain looseness. I try, I think because what I don't like about CAD is it is super precise and it's precise in a way that goes so far beyond like our like lived reality. And like, don't even get me started on Revit. Mm -hmm. But like, <laughs> I think I, as a response to that, and this is one of the things I'm interested to see now that I'm kind of like, <laughs> you know sort of going full time with my own practice and I'm gonna have to shift slightly the type of work I do and the way that I work like maybe I'll less have the luxury of working in these slightly more like playful ways but um yeah for me like the process as much as possible is hands-on analog um kind of drawing it up like uh in CAD like when I absolutely have to. <laughs> and would you say that process is queer in one in, in any way? I mean, it feels like that for me because as I say, like I feel like the way that we draw these days or the way that we model, it in, it's it comes from like a capitalist place of like ultra precision that's about liability and you know uh you know faster 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 and faster like ultimately it's like this is why like i identify as a luddite and a lot of people like are familiar like the luddites weren't like anti-tech like they were basically a, a group of kind of workers who just wanted to be in control of new technology instead of it kind of just putting them out of work and you know it's like we have new technology and it just makes us work faster and and not doesn't actually help us that's how for example i feel about Revit. is that like it people talk about it like it's revolutionary but actually what it means in an office is people go yeah we can do the tender package in eight weeks we're using Revit. it's like well so it's not saving us any time it's just making us work harder faster um so yeah i um it feels good to me because anything that feels slow and like kind of slightly fluffy that feels with me like recently i started uh, i'm doing some drawings in silicon like mixing silicon and then squeezing it with like a um an icing bag and that is a gay way to draw because you've got no control over it <laughs> any question from the floor and then, because then, then maybe I'll finish with one that follows on, on to that. Because I think the way you were describing your being a Luddite and that, <laughs> I think it, it, it explained a lot of how you've presented your, your work, yeah. but also your process. But it was making me think of a an event recently 
the different um, feminist collectives or the feminist figures within architecture at the AA and um, Sarah Wigglesworth was their guest of honor and she explained her house in Islington and a lot of the material decisions. Uh, I was reading a sort of like techno skepticism mm. built in them. And and I asked her if, if she thought there was, a, first if she agreed that there was a level of skepticism about technology and whether that was coming from a feminist point of view. And yeah. I'm asking, do you think there's a queer way of being a techno skeptic? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was talking about this at the AA actually this week. Um, I was like doing this podcast and one of the questions was, if you could invent any new piece of tech, what would it be? And I was like, no more tech. We have enough. Like, you can have new tech under a completely different, like, uh, system. But, like, new tech under capitalism is, like, is being used for warmongering and, like, exploiting workers, <laughs> you know, at the, eventually, if not at the start of its conception. So, um, yeah, I think I just feel increasingly... Uh, I don't know I think although something I do enjoy and I think that like that house Stock Orchard Street which is kind of one of my favorite buildings like has this in it like I do love a combination of like um like extremely like artificial next to like natural which is why like I love doing that project with like all these sort of ropes that are basically plastic like these brightly colored ropes and then making um guy rope tighteners out of twigs like from the woods like I, I, there's something that feels a bit queer about um i guess like yeah i mean the artificial and the i don't know because it's, it's going back to that question of nature as well i guess but i guess like, i think about that a lot as like a trans person and like particularly this idea of almost like prosthetics or like where the line is with that type of stuff and again it's a it's a bit of a <laughs> jumbled answer but um maybe you get where i'm going with it i don't get where you're going right if we don't oh um hello thank you for the presentation um you have talked about how your queer thinking has influenced the way you design and the way you perform architecture but i'm interested in how queer thinking has influenced the way you manage projects mm -hmm. because according to critical management studies um every project is a social construct um realized by people and for people and it's shape but the person who managed them so i would like to know how queer thinking influenced that in your case yeah that's actually such a great question like so at the community center that was like a really great opportunity to experiment so everyone there like the plumber the electrician everyone working on it wasn't was an lgbt people person and i was like what an incredible opportunity to like be on site, be on a construction site where everyone is being normal to me and I, and and we're all being normal to each other. And that's what it was like. And I genuinely found it like, was like quite emotional, quite moving that like, you know, that I, it was collaborative. So it's not saying like, when I say that I felt respected by people, I don't mean in the sense that like, I was like the architect coming in telling people what to do. It was just that like, I was being respected by people because they weren't looking at me, me being like, what are you, you know? Um, so, that site was like a really great opportunity to try and do things differently to try and there wasn't really like contracts or anything like it was a bit wishy-washy um but it meant that like to kind of just have conversations with people you know like obviously when something is on a tight line a timeline that tight <laughs> things go wrong things are going wrong left right and center like you know, we had this like countertop that was donated from COP26 that was like late coming down. We didn't know when it was going to come, like furniture arriving at all different times. Our friend had all some plywood and it was like five times the price that she thought it was going to be like. And I think that like in a traditional construction site, that would be like, right, like you get sued for this extension of time, blah, 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 like madness. Yeah. Whereas this was just sort of like, we're just having conversations. We're all figuring this out together. Like, you know, it was collaborative and it's been like that on all those projects. I guess the Barbican, that went relatively smoothly, but like, 
um that's much more of like a sort of normal working environment um but yeah i think that it's trying to like bring a certain politics to the table like and and i'm interested to see like say with the community center if they're able to find another space and, and it's more of like a large scale project like how does that kind of stuff actually pan out if you're trying to build you know because it's it's when you're doing something small scale and it's all kind of like people that know each other or friends of friends like it's a lot easier to do this slightly more caring approach but when things get like a bit bigger budget and all, like you know suddenly it's like we're filling out this we're doing that and yeah. like this is at stake and that's i think when things can not get nasty but like complicated yeah so i think that's like a really interesting field because um in particular like i feel like on these projects i try to experiment with that type of thing like trying to do a project in a queer way but it's still like just sort of experiment it's just like pulling on from like experiences of like organizing or like friends who've organized or things that i've read and you know it's not coming from what would be amazing is like some kind of like toolkit of like you know how can we build community projects together that's like a complete alternative to like all the literature we have around like jct or whatever you know body of knowledge for projects that is so rich and so agitated yeah exactly thank you okay um, I think we're bringing this to a yeah. close. Martha, thank you so much. Thank Please you. Let me thank you, Martha, for this wonderful <laughs> And thanks everyone for joining us in person and online as well. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I've had such a such an incredibly long week. <laughs>